So, you know, this whole thing with Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore getting uh, getting some extra time on the ISS. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I, it really got me thinking. It's definitely a big deal. Yeah, and it seems like these extended stays, you know, planned or not, are becoming a kind of like a regular part of, uh, well, of how we're pushing the limits in space. Right. And I think it speaks to, well, it speaks to how we are continually learning and adapting as we go further and stay longer in space. What might seem like a uh, an unexpected hiccup is actually more like, you know, a stepping stone in this grand journey of exploration. You got it. And I think that's what we're really going to dive into today. We're cutting through the noise, so to speak, and getting right to the heart of the matter. Our mission, should we choose to accept it, is to... Uh, uh, to explore the history and the reasons behind those really long space flights. Absolutely. We're going to break it down, make it easy to digest, and hopefully uh, spark some really interesting thoughts. Definitely. And our main source for this deep dive is uh, is this really insightful article that lays out the major space flight records and, uh, and why those records are so important. It gives us a fantastic look at how far we've come and where we might be going. Yeah, it's a great overview of, you know, the evolution of long duration space flight and the critical role it plays in our future ambitions, especially when we talk about, uh, you know, venturing further out into the solar system. OK, so let's jump right in. When we talk about long stretches in space, the name Valery Polyakov comes to mind. 437 days straight on Mir. That's, oh. I mean, that's almost a year and a half. Right. A truly remarkable feat of human endurance. That mission, you know, it ran from 1994 to 1995, and it was a real trailblazer. The main purpose was to study the effects of long-term spaceflight, basically simulating a crewed mission to Mars. That's wild. Simulating a Mars mission back then, they were really ahead of the curve. And then uh, more recently, we had Frank Rubio's 371-day mission on the ISS, wrapping up in 2023. Yeah, that one made headlines. The longest single spaceflight by a U.S. astronaut. Hmm. What made that mission especially significant? Well, for starters, Rubio's mission was only supposed to be six months long, but then they ran into some issues with the Soyuz spacecraft and they had to extend his stay. It was a real-time demonstration of how important it is to be adaptable, you know, have those backup plans in place when you're dealing with the, uh, the unpredictable nature of space travel. Yeah, it was a true test of adaptability. So we see Polyakov's mission, which was planned to be a long one, and then we have Rubio's mission, where things, well... They didn't quite go according to plan, but they adapted. And there have been other significant single missions as well, right? Ones that have really pushed the envelope. Oh, absolutely. Just before Rubio, we had Mark Fonde Hay, who spent 355 days on the ISS from 2021 to 2022. And of course, there's Scott Kelly's one-year mission back in 2015 and 2016, where he spent 340 days in space. And that one was, uh, was really interesting because NASA used it to study those long-term impacts, comparing Scott's health and even his genes to his twin brother Mark, who stayed on Earth. Right. The twin study. That was fascinating. Really groundbreaking stuff, helping us to understand all those subtle ways our bodies change in space. And we can't forget Christina Koch, who spent an incredible 328 days on the ISS from 2019 to 2020. Yes. That was the longest single space flight by a woman, providing valuable insights into how, you know, how extended space travel affects women. It's about getting that... Uh getting a complete picture, you know, making sure we're studying the effects on everyone who might go to space. Right, absolutely. And this article we're referencing it actually has a quick facts list that summarizes all those amazing single flights. It's pretty awe-inspiring when you see the names of those dates laid out like that. Yeah, those are the pioneers pushing those boundaries. And every single day they spend in space is like, ah, it's like adding a piece to the puzzle of, you know, of human adaptation to space. Now, let's shift gears a little bit. Beyond those long single missions, there's another way to look at this cumulative time. The total amount of time an astronaut has spent in space over, you know, over their entire career. It's a testament to their dedication, right? It is. Spending that much time in space over multiple missions really shows a commitment to pushing the limits of human spaceflight. And it's not just about, you know, setting records. It's about those repeated exposures to the space environment, that ability to uh, to bounce back and adapt again and again. And Ole Kononenko, he's the current record holder. Can you believe this? 11,111 days over multiple missions. That's more than three years in space. Wow, three years. It's mind-boggling to think about. And it's incredible that he's still actively contributing to the ISS program. Mm -hmm. All that experience, those long-term observations, it's just invaluable for understanding how humans adapt, how we change over time and microgravity. 
Absolutely. We're getting those long term data points, insights into things like, you know, bone density, cardiovascular health, and even those subtle changes in uh, in cognitive function that can happen after extended periods in space. Right. And he's in good company, too. Gennady Padalka has an incredible 878 days. And Sergei Krikalev, he's racked mm. up 803 days. Yeah. These are the veterans, the cosmonauts who've paved the way. And on the U.S. side, we have Peggy Whitson with the record at 675 days. She's a legend. And Jeff Williams also clocks in with a very impressive 534 days. They've practically made the ISS their second home. They have. And again, that quick facts list, you know, it's not just a bunch of numbers. It really drives home the magnitude of what these individuals have accomplished. You know, the sheer dedication and the sacrifices they've made to advance our understanding of, uh, of what it takes to live and work in space. Okay, so we've talked about the who and the how long, but let's get to the why. What's the driving force behind these extended missions? What's the big picture here? Well, it boils down to this research. Before we can even think about sending humans on those deep space missions, especially to Mars, which is uh, it's like the ultimate long duration space flight challenge. The big one, yeah. Right. We need to understand in detail what happens to the human body during long periods in space. So these missions, they're not just about breaking records. It's about gathering that crucial data yeah. that's going to make those future missions possible. Right? Exactly. We need to know how microgravity affects our bones, our muscles, our cardiovascular system. We need to study how radiation, you know, radiation outside of Earth's protective atmosphere, how that impacts the human body. And uh, and we need to know how to deal with the psychological challenges of isolation, of being in a confined environment for months or even years. Yeah, the mental aspect of space travel is a whole other layer of complexity. It is. And the more we learn from these long duration missions, the better we can prepare for the challenges of sending humans to Mars and beyond. It's about developing the right countermeasures, you know, the right technologies and strategies to mitigate those risks. So it's not just about keeping the astronauts healthy during those long flights. It's about making sure they're OK when they come back to Earth through. Right. And it's about constantly improving, you know, refining the design of our spacecraft, making those life support systems more efficient and coming up with more advanced ways to monitor the health of the crew. And these unexpected situations, like when Rubio's mission got extended, they also teach us valuable lessons, right? They do. Rubio's situation really highlighted the importance of being flexible, having those well-defined procedures in place, and understanding how teams can function effectively, even when things go off script. That's like space itself is giving us these real-world pop quizzes. In a way, it is. And we're constantly learning, adapting, and improving. And all of that feeds back into making those deep space missions safer and more realistic. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how all of these individual stories, these missions, they're all interconnected, contributing to this much bigger goal. Exactly. It's a collective effort, a global endeavor to expand our presence beyond Earth. And those astronauts, they're the pioneers, paving the way for the rest of us to follow. So just to recap, we've seen how these record-breaking missions, whether they were meticulously planned or had those unexpected extensions, they all demonstrate incredible human resilience and uh, they're absolutely vital for making those interplanetary journeys, those dreams of reaching Mars and beyond, a real possibility. Right. And it's about more than just, you know, getting there and planting a flag. It's about understanding how to do it safely, how to protect the health and well-being of those brave explorers who are venturing out into the unknown. Yeah. It's a really exciting time to be following space exploration with all these new discoveries and ambitious plans for the future. But it also makes you think, you know, with all the challenges we've talked about, the physical, the mental, the technological hurdles, what do you think are the biggest ethical or practical concerns that we as a species need to address, you know, to make sure that long duration space travel isn't just something we can do, but something we can do responsibly, sustainably for everyone who might want to go out there is a big question, one that's worth pondering as we set our sights on the stars. It is. There's a lot to consider, and those conversations need to happen now as we're taking these big steps towards becoming a, you know, a true spacefaring civilization. Absolutely. It's a fascinating time, full of challenges and opportunities. I'm really excited to see what the future holds. Me too.